Previously, we saw that inbreeding depression can reduce offspring size, reproductive output, and also offspring survival. It is not uncommon that inbreeding depression has catastrophic consequences for plant fitness. This figure shows four mustard plants, all of the same age. The one on the left is an outcrossed plant, whereas the other three are produced by self-pollination of the plant on the left. You can clearly see the dramatic reduction of plant performance in these three self plants, even though not all of them are affected by inbreeding depression in exactly the same way. The differences observed between some plants are likely due to the different gene combinations that they have inherited from their parents. With such dire consequences from inbreeding, it is no wonder that many flowering plants have evolved reproductive strategies that actually stop them from self-pollinating. Some of these strategies are dichogamy or asynchronous development of male and female functions, percogamy or differences in anterostigma lengths or positions, and self-incompatibility where the germination of cell pollen is blocked by the plant. Dichogamy occurs when the male and female function do not develop at the same time. In Asteraceae, the florets of an inflorescence open from the periphery towards the center. The most outward flowers are always male, whereas the central ones are female. This transition from male to female function is called protandry. Other species, such as Plantago lanceolata, are protogenous. They first produce female, followed by male flowers. Flowering in Plantago lanceolata is ascending. It goes from the bottom to the top of the inflorescence. The oldest flowers are therefore at the bottom of the inflorescence and are always male. On the illustration, you can see their protruding anthers. Above them are flowers that have just opened and they're female and the flowers on the top are still unopened. Percogamy is the physical separation of the male and female parts of a flower. Usually, the anthers and the stigma are of different lengths so that there is no possibility of direct contact between them. But some species have gone through extra effort of evolving special types of percogamy. For instance, Cowslips have two different configurations of anther and stigma length. S form, where the stigma is short and hidden inside the floral tube, and L form, where the stigma is long and protruding from the tube. Percogamy favors pollen deposition from one morph to the other. When an L morph is visited by a pollinator, the short anthers deposit the pollen on the pollinator's head. When the pollinator then visits an S flower, the pollen it carries will come in contact with the short stigma. The inverse happens when a pollinator first visits an S flower and picks its pollen and then visits an L flower. If the pollinator visits two flowers of the same type, the position of the pollen on its body will be such that it cannot come into contact with the stigma. Cowslips are really not taking any chances with self-pollination. In addition to being heterostylous, there is a morph incompatibility system. Pollen from the S morph will not be able to germinate on an S stigma, even if it manages to find its way to the stigma. Another type of percogamy is enantiosteli, where one species has flowers with different types of symmetry. In Solanum rostratum, for instance, the flowers can be either left-styled or right-styled. The style is the white curved filament pointed by the arrow. The species also has four regular yellow anthers and the fifth dark and curved anther. Thus, when a pollinator visits a right-styled flower, the large anther will deposit pollen on the left side of the insect. This pollen can then be transferred on the mirrored image flower. Another very convoluted type of hercogamy is flexistyly, 
as observed in species of the tropical genus Salpinia. The species has male and female flowers. In male flowers, the style is non-receptive and curved upward, so that it stands above the anthers and pollen doesn't fall on it. In female flowers, the style is receptive and curved downwards. So far, this kind of resembles heterostyly. But what is really fascinating about flexistyly is that the configuration and therefore the sexual function of the flower changes throughout the day. About half of the plants in the population are male in the morning and female in the afternoon, and the other half are female in the morning and male in the afternoon. They switch their configuration at midday, and that way the plant can either give or receive pollen at a specific time, but never both. This avoids its self-pollination. Finally, some species have evolved self-incompatibility systems, which allow them to recognize their own pollen and prevent its germination if it falls on their own stigma. This is done thanks to a glycoprotein that is coating the surface of the pollen and can bind to the receptors of a stigma. The protein and the receptor are produced by a complex of genes, which includes a polymorphic gene that can contain anything from two to dozens of alleles per population. These are called the S alleles. We distinguish two types of self-incompatibility, gametophytic and sporophytic. In the case of gametophytic self-incompatibility, the pollen expresses only one of the two S alleles of its maternal plant. A homozygote plant produces only one type of pollen, and the heterozygote plant will produce two types of pollen in equal proportions. A pistil expresses both of the maternal alleles in glycoprotic receptors on its surface. If the alleles expressed on the surface of the pollen gran matches either of the two alleles presented in the diploid maternal tissue of the pistil, there is a self-recognition reaction. The pistil produces extracellular glycoproteins that enter self-compatible pollen tubes where they act as a cytotoxin and degrade their RNA. In sporophytic incompatibility, both S alleles are expressed at the pollen surface. Self-pollen rejection occurs if either of the two alleles on the pollen is recognized by either of the alleles in the pistil. What is interesting about self-incompatibility system in plants is that the S gene is labeled. So new S alleles are regularly produced by mutation. The new alleles can easily spread in the population because of the negative frequency dependent selection, which favors rare S alleles. Imagine this population with two S genotypes. Each of the genotypes cannot reproduce with itself. So the more abundant the genotype is, the fewer possible partners it has. The pink one can reproduce with about 70% of the population and the yellow one with about a third of the population. Now imagine a new allele appears in the population marked here in blue. This is by far the rarest allele in the population and it can reproduce with all individuals that have the yellow or pink allele. Over time, this blue genotype will produce more offspring simply because it has more potential partners, whereas the yellow one will produce less. This will eventually lead to balanced frequencies of the three self-incompatibility genotypes. If at a given time the frequency of one genotype increases, the number of its potential partners will decrease, so it will produce fewer offspring for the next generation. This is what we call frequency-dependent selection. The fitness of an individual depends on the frequency of the other genotypes in the population. Moreover, this is a negative frequency-dependent selection because there is a negative correlation between the fitness of a genotype and its abundance in the population. If a fourth S allele occurs in the population due to a new mutation, 
its frequency will also increase until it reaches a stable state. In theory, a population can have an unlimited number of alleles, and at equilibrium, the frequency of each allele will be 1 over the number of different alleles in the population.